is C scallop abundance, distribution, and group. And the clicker should be up there. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so my name is Mike Tory, and I'm a second year iGRID student in the School of Marine Sciences. Um, my dissertation research focuses on the development of a modeling framework um, to link uh, environmental suitability to um, scalp, abundance, distribution, and growth. Um, the framework will comprise a variety of approaches to quantitatively describe scalp ecology, um, but today's talk will focus mostly on the first step of this, which is uh, the development of a habitat suitability index model. And I just want to give a brief background of the scallop fishery. Um, these are federal landings, and you can see that it's kind of characterized by a, a boom bust cycle, and currently it's the most valuable fishery in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and conversely, these are the, the main scallop landings, which again uh, goes through the boom and bust cycles, um, but it's not doing quite as well at the moment. Um, but recent data shows that it's starting to come back, and so it's an important um, fishery to study to help kind of keep it higher. And so this research um, is carried out in the context of abrupt climate change. Uh, and the Gulf of Maine is um, experiencing a warming trend. And so the plot on the left shows the warming trend over the past 30 years. Um, and it's broken up by 12 months. Um, and the red indicates warming trends, and the blue indicates a cooling trend. So you can see um, the difference between the 30-year trend and the 10-year trend. So if you look over to the right, you see um, a much a much more intense warming trend uh, over the recent decade. And this represents a Gulf-wide 2 to 3 degrees level of warming. <clears throat> so uh, the Gulf of Maine, Maine is warming faster than the vast majority of the, of the world's oceans. Um, and this has an effect on many species. Um, black sea bass is, is a commonly used example. It's historically a mid-Atlantic species, but uh, it, it's been moving northward uh, due to the warming temperatures. Um, and now it's, it's frequently seen off southern Maine. And actually, uh, one of my lab mates goes diving off Mount Desert Island and he's seen them there. So it's even it's past southern Maine at this point. <clears throat> uh, so scallops are sensitive to changes in water temperature and abrupt climate change may influence their survival and uh, spatial distribution. So that's where the habitat suitability index model comes in. Um, <clears throat> and basically um, what it does is it relates a bunch of different environmental layers to a species abundance, and you can get predicted habitat suitability over space of time. So this flow chart basically goes over how uh, the model works. You have your species abundance data. For this, I'm using uh, the DMR <coughs> survey, which goes back to 2006 um, and samples the inshore waters of the Gulf of Maine. And then for my environmental variables, I'm using temperature, salinity, depth, uh, and bottom composition. For temperature and salinity, I'm using uh, inputs from the uh, finite volume community ocean model, or FECOM. Um, and this basically uh, produces predictions of temperature and salinity back to 1978, 2013 on a pretty fine uh, spatial resolution. Um, for depth, I'm using this US coastal relief model. For bottom substrate, I'm using this USGS uh, sediment layer. Um, and recently, I added um, current speed as a metric to get um, food availability into the HSI. And this is also actually from uh, FDCOM. And so basically, you use the survey data and the environmental data to uh, generate these suitability indexes. And then you map predictions um, over the, the Gulf of Maine. And so these are the suitability indexes that I generated. Um, what immediately is apparent, well, if you can't read, I guess the text is kind of small. It's uh, temperature in the top left, salinity, depth, bottom type, and current speed in the bottom left. Um, <clears throat> and what immediately was apparent to me was this, this double peak in uh, depth. And so I'm actually using two separate surveys that the, that the DMR carries out. One of them only samples in the three mile line. So it's inshore water, and that's this 
peak on the left here, and then the peak on the right is from the Northern Gulf Main Survey, um, which um, covers the shoal areas uh, outside of the three mile line. And so you get this difference in, in depth preference between the two, um, the offshore and inshore scallops, which also correspond to differences in temperature preferences. Um, so I broke these down into just the inshore scallops and the offshore scallops. So this is inshore. Uh, you can see uh, their depth preference. This was that the peak on the left uh, around 10 meters, um, which corresponds to temperature. Um, and this is their their uh, their range for current speed, which um, I looked at just to, to verify this. I looked at studies that were done in, in flumes. So they put scallops in the flume and they and they measured their feeding rate um, over different current velocities, and, and this kind of matches up with what their range was. And this is the offshore. So you get slightly different preferences here. Uh, lower temperature, deeper, and uh, the current speed is uh, towards the, the slower end of the, the spectrum that I found from the, the lab studies. And it's slower than the inshore, um, which may be due to um, plankton abundance, or uh, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> so the suitability units that I generated are pretty new, and I haven't had time to map, uh, use those suitability indexes to map predictions. So these are from a previous version of the model, um, but I just I put them here to, to get kind of give you an idea of what the, the model outputs will look like. Um, so this is showing a uh, median median HSI values over the 36 year study period, which is from 1977 to 2013, because that's when the FECOM has predictions. Um, and then this is another example. These are uh, 3D models and uh, 3D maps. I'm using these to kind of show the relationship between depth, which is a key factor in this model, and uh, habitat suitability. And they need some tweaking to, to uh, kind of bring this out more, but you can kind of see here that the inshore areas and um, I think that Stellwagen and Bank, that shoal area, uh, have higher suitability than um, the adjacent deeper areas. And so that's the HSI, that's where I'm at with it. Um, <clears throat> for future work, I'm looking at scalp distribution and growth modeling. Um, so to predict scalp distribution, I'll use a two-stage GAM that takes into account um, in the first stage, scalp presence absence, and then where scalps are present. The second stage, um, the second stage looked at abundance, and for growth, um, I'll use the data set that the Chen Lab has been compiling, um, looking at shell heights and, and uh, growth increments um, to relate growth to environmental variability. So. I also want to develop a model that simulates scallop population growth or decline over different rotational closure scenarios. Um, the DMR manages scallops based on some of these openings and, and closings. Um, but the closure times aren't set up really in regards to the scallop biology. Um, so I want to look at whether these can be improved. And I've kind of I've started with this. Um, and what this is is a very simplistic version of the model that I want to end up with. It's a cellular autonomous <coughs> approach um, where each cell is either occupied or unoccupied by a single scallop. And it follows simple rules. Uh, these are the, the parameters up there. So fecundity um, is a set growth rate, set natural mortality. Um, and so yeah, the, the parameters right now are, are homogeneous over space and time. And you can maybe see that um, fishing pressure alternates between these three areas. So the matrix is broken up into three areas and, and fishing pressure will alternate between time steps. Um, and so at this point, uh, the model is too simplistic to really provide any meaningful simulations. Um, but I want to add um, uh, closure area delineations, uh, outputs from the HSI model to, to um, put in kind of habitat heterogeneity 
and then predicted scout distribution and habitat growth relationships. And ultimately, I kind of want to build a model that emulates a scaled down version of environmental conditions and predicted scout distribution along the main coast, um, and then run simulations to help determine good or bad rotational closure parameters. And that's it. I miss the, uh, the the meaning of the suitability index. Is high index most suitable? Yeah. So the red colors. Were. And so the so the dashed line across those that, above that is suitable or suitable habitat. Yeah, that was we cut it off at uh, zero point eight. So okay. it's an index from from one to zero. Yeah. One being high and zero being right. above. Yep. Yeah. Are there interactions between lobstermen and scallopers? Uh, they try to minimize that um, because the scallop season is uh, in the winter. But I think that if, if there's warm years and the lobster may put their gear out early, there can be. So how does that uh, fit into your model? Does things get warmer? Um, I'm not sure. I guess it, it affects where the survey, when and where the survey runs, which might affect the model predictions. And also lobsters in general uh, are a major predator for scallops. So as their distribution changes, um, scallops likely will respond to that. What is responsible for the boom and bust cycle, do you know? Uh, I think it has to do, it's a lot to do with recruitment, which in, in fisheries in general, it's really hard to predict. So, I mean, it's, it's environmental. Certain years you have uh, high recruitment, and in other years you don't. And it, it kind of lags behind. So it's, it's really hard to predict if you'll get a good recruitment year or bad at this point. Um, but I guess that's where you know models come in. Thank you. Next up. We have Kate Warner discussing uh, investigating the response of Maine's drinking water resources to extreme precipitation events. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to talk about a portion of my uh, dissertation research looking at these extreme events and how they're influencing drinking water lakes in Maine. Uh, so to start, a figure and something you're all probably very familiar with is that we're seeing an increase in extreme precipitation events, um, particularly in the northeastern United States. And here they define an extreme rain event as the heaviest 1% of all events from 1901 till 2012. Um, and this is important because uh, where they uh, increase pre or precipitation events are expected to increase in frequency and magnitude. And this is important because uh, this change may be more influential than average change on certain ecosystems. And another figure you're familiar with is that in Maine, we're also seeing an increase in the frequency and intensity of rain events, uh, particularly over the last decade. Um, here, they define an extreme rain event as two inches or more of rain during uh, 24 hour, over the course of 24 hours. And so why are we looking at uh, increased precipitation events on aquatic ecosystems? Um, it can have several effects on these water bodies, including altering the water chemistry, um, leading to increased dissolved organic carbon, nutrient loading, and increased particulate. Um, and so my research is focused on this concept of increased dissolved organic carbon. Uh, and Previous work done by another student from UMaine uh, suggests that during an extreme wet year, we see an increase in the amount of dissolved organic carbon. And so this is done over a 30 year database of 84 remote lakes across the Northeast, some of which are here in Maine. And so this is deviation from the mean. So we have greater than average DOC concentrations during a wet year as compared to a dry year. And so DOC, just as a reminder, uh, it can generally comes from the decomposition of plant and animal material in the landscape and it is present in the soil and may become dissolved in water. And so it flows into lakes and streams through surface ground and soil waters. And it's very important for helping to regulate ecosystem structure and function. It typically imparts that brown or tea stain color that we see on many main lakes. Um, and it can also, it can influence water transparency, oxygen availability, um, and the bioavailability of nutrients, among other things. 
And so my research is focused not only on the amount of DOC that we're seeing, but also the quality, which is indicative or an important indicator of the type or the source of where that DOC is coming from. And from a drinking water perspective, this is important because um, how the DOC reacts with treatment processes such as chlorine or ozone um, is very dependent on the quality of this organic matter. And so I'm looking at a suite of metrics, but I'll focus on one today, which is SUVA, which Rachel mentioned yesterday. And that represents where the DOC is coming from. So it gives more of a signal that's coming from the terrestrial environment versus within the lake processes. Um, and again, in a drinking water context, they may use this number to determine how much total organic carbon they might have to remove <clears throat> during treatment. And so I kind of pose two questions looking at how DOC quantity and quality change in response to an extreme precipitation event, and then that further trying to dis uh, distinguish what the timing and magnitude of these responses across our lakes. So to conduct this study, we have six lakes across the state of Maine. Uh, this is Chasey's Pond, which is in York, Maine. Uh, Sebago Lake, the largest drinking water source. Jordan Pond in Acadia. Floods Pond in Bangor. Nokomis Pond in Newport. And then Young Lake is in Mars Hill. And this is table is simply to show you that in, in addition to being uh, widely distributed spatially across the state, we're also looking at um, lakes that are variable in their size, depth, and initial DOC concentration so that we can see how different systems respond. Uh, so this past fall, we captured three precipitation events. Uh, we were lucky enough to capture the large event that happened at the end of September, um, where it rained about six inches in the Portland area. And to conduct this study, we collected water samples from the intake of each uh, water source. And the reason for collecting water from the intake uh, was largely because uh, we felt that would be the most relevant for our question in terms of looking at drinking water. Um, it's also logistically much easier because we had a lot of help collecting water samples from each of the water districts. And so we collected water 24 hours before the storm, 24 to 48 hours after, five to seven days after, and then three weeks after the rain event. And so thinking about this first question of how quantity and quality change in response to a precipitation event, um, we have this graph here. So these are our six lakes. And on the x-axis is the time or the date. Uh, these dashed lines indicate the storm event. And then on the y-axis is DOC concentration. It is a little small. So on um, Chase's Pond at the top in Sebago and Jordan, we really see relatively little change. Um, the Comas Pond and Floods Pond, however, um, we kind of see a sustained increase. You can see that particularly evident over the first extreme event. And then Young Lake, uh, we have these spikes in DOC concentration, and then it returns to pre-storm event levels. And although these changes uh, don't look extremely large, um, an aquatic ecosystem, sometimes even a small change in DOC uh, could have ecological implications. So just for example, a flood pond went roughly from three to four uh, milligrams per liter of DOC. And so that changes our attenuation depth of PAR from seven to five. And PAR is the amount of light that's available for photosynthesis. So if, you're, uh, if you change it from seven and it's reduced to five, that could have implications for organisms within the water. And so here, we still have our DOC concentration in the solid, and then in the dash line, it's SUVA. So that, it kind of follows the same patterns as our DOC, which is somewhat expected because SUVA, you measure the absorbance at 254 nanometers, and this is divided or normalized by the DOC concentration. Um, and we do see it increase with storms, which would be indicative of a more terrestrial signal, which we would anticipate with runoff from the storm event. Um, one thing we're trying to look at, too, is to see if the quality metric is more variable than our DOC quantity, um, because it may, quality could end up being a more important uh, um, metric to look at than the, than the amount of DOC and its implications on drinking water treatment. So just to kind of summarize this first part, obviously uh, more data to collect. The DOC quantity and quality still 
has these three patterns, the sustained increase is or no change, and DOC quality may be more variable than DOC quantity. So thinking about this next question about the magnitude timing of response. Um, so this is a lot of information, but it's broken down into two of the storm events. And so this is looking at the percent change that we're seeing. And so this is the larger event, the September 30th, and this is later in November. Um, so I realize it's hard to see with young uh, dictate some of our change here. But I think one thing that I've noticed so far in looking at this, and there's more analyses to do, is that uh, the magnitude of response is different. And I know, like I said, that Young's may be driving some of this change, but when you look at these smaller ones individually, aside from this one anomaly, there's a greater percent change in our amount of DOC for the larger rain event than the smaller rain event, which we would expect, I think. Um, however, looking at this, when we look at SUVA, I noticed that the opposite happened. And so we have a greater percent change in this other storm event. And I'm not 100% sure yet as to why. Um, the lakes had turned over at that point, so that could be an influencing factor. Um, but something I'll have to continue to research. And so kind of summing up this, and also I think we do see a variety of response. The magnitude varies. Um, this is going to depend on the amount of precipitation. I think more storm data analyses are necessary. But again, uh, looking at this, I do think do we do see a little bit more variability in our quality metric as compared to our, our concentration. And so why is this important for drinking water utilities? Uh, increased dissolving rate of carbon can lead to increased nuisance algae, taste and odor problems. Um, it can alter disinfection byproducts and also be food for such types of bacteria. So this is all important for treatment and for just water quality in general. Um, and so the additional work that we're working on now and we'll continue to work on in the future are also looking at changes in nutrient concentrations and how those might vary with extreme precipitation events, as well as algal biomass in the phytoplankton community. Um, and then we'll continue to measure more storms throughout this upcoming season. And then some conclusions. So one thing that I didn't go into detail about is um, what's happening around the lake is very important for what's happening within the lake. Uh, so the surrounding landscape and what uh, what type of land use and things like that will all influence the type and amount of DOC that we see. Uh, so we'll be doing some GIS analyses as well to look at the difference among the lakes there. And then in concluding point, I just think that understanding the extreme events of aquatic ecosystems uh, and the effects of increasing DOC are important for management strategies. And with that, I owe a big thank you to the water districts and my advisors and my lab mates for What do you think is going on in Young's Lake? Like, why is that so significant? It's very different uh, from the other lakes. And one thing that I, I took out of this talk is uh, like the ratio of the surrounding watershed uh, to the size of the lake itself is very large. So the lake is much smaller than the other lake. Uh, and then and, uh, it has a pretty large watershed. So I think that um, that makes, as, as compared to Sebago, which is really large, um, I think that the effects are more pronounced in that lake. Um, it also has a bigger outflow. I think that is influencing how it's responding as well. So next up, we have Courtney King uh, <laughs> discussing millennial scale reconstruction of the last glacial maximum and onset of the termination A, uh, brilliant 10 chronology of the right lateral moraines of the former Pukaki Glacier, Southern Alps, New Zealand. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so the transition from last glacial period to the interglacial record, the largest climatic reorganization of the past 100,000 years. In order to understand what drove this termination of this glacier, um, as well as the mechanisms that transfer it around the globe, it's important we date this event at a number of sites around the world. In the southern hemisphere in particular, we can study past ice fluctuation in order to gain an understanding of the atmospheric component of the system. Uh, so for my project in particular, I'm looking at identifying the last robust advance of the former Kukanki Glacier during the last glacial period in order to pour insight into the onset of the termination. Uh, so my project aims to uh, answer and address these two questions, and that is what caused Southern Hemisphere termination, as well as when did it occur? So uh, once we understand the when, we can uh, compare it to other climate proxies in order to get at the drivers of this event. So <clears throat> where are the Southern Alps? New Zealand is located in the South Pacific Ocean, situated right in the Southern Hemisphere mid-latitude. So here are the Southern Alps. Um, and during the last glacial period, the Southern Alps contained an ice cap from which numerous outlet glaciers emanated. Um, previous work from the New Zealand maritime glaciers indicate that they are most sensitive to atmospheric temperature. Uh, therefore, the, this region really um, is key for understanding Southern Hemisphere mid-latitude uh, climate change. Um, so I do my work in uh, the Kukaki Basin in here. Um, and I chose this region um, because for two key reasons, really. One is that um, there is a known presence of very well-preserved glacial deposits. Um, and also the uh, data chronology that we use, so surface exposure each dating, has been known to work very well in this region. So here are a few of the previously done uh, published studies from this region, uh, some of which are even UMaine master's students here, um, or PhD students, as Dr. Butler um, was. <laughs> um, so from these four studies, I picked out the uh, ages from the last robust advance. So you can see them here. That'd be kind of hard to see. Um, but it's important to note, so this comes out to about 23 samples from that last uh, robust advance, but it's important to note that 10 of these come from this region here located alongside the upper right laterals. Um, therefore, I chose to do my work uh, along the right lateral ring. So on the right side of the screen is an oblique air photo uh, looking um, up valley. So for reference, I slow would be from uh, this direction kind of off to the right. Um, and on the right side of the screen is a uh, geomorphic map drawn by Bjorn Anderson with the different colors representing the different stages of New Zealand glaciation. So for my work, I'm focusing on this red color here, uh, which represents the last portion of the uh, last glacial period. Uh, so in addition to working in right lateral moraine, I also did some uh, collected a few samples from the terminal section, which I'll show later. Um, and for reference, the distance between a boundary stream tarn, which is where 10 of the samples came from, is about eight kilometers between these two. Uh, <clears throat> so we take a systematic approach to our field work in that we first map the region, the geomorphology of the region, identifying the landforms of the event that we want to date. Once we uh, do that, we can then traverse those ridges to pick out boulders suitable for sampling. And so just quick overview in case you weren't here last night of how this method works. Rocks are entrained in the glacier, then they ablate out onto the morning crust, um, at which point they're exposed to incoming cosmic rays of radiation, which is seen here. These cosmic rays react with the boulder surface to accumulate cosmogenic nuclei, such as beryllium 10. Um, these cosmogenic nuclides accumulate at a known production rate. We can then come along and collect a sample from the surface of that rock and take it to the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, uh, where it undergoes basically two different processes. The first is quartz preparation. So the quartz is the mineral that collects the cosmogenic nuclides. So first we need to isolate it and clean it, and then we can uh, really isolate the beryllium, taking out all of the other um, elements. 
Uh, once we do that, we send it off to Lawrence Livermore, where the beryllium content is measured. And applying that known production rate, we can calculate an age, um, which I have plotted on the screen. So again, is the geomorphic map on the left done by Roy Anderson. Um, and the three samples from the terminal <coughs> section produce a mean age of 18.4 thousand years ago. Um, four ridges within the terminal complex, or sorry, within the right lateral complex of that last robust advance for the last glacial period produce mean ages of 18.8, 18.6, 19.0, and 19.2. And then all of the age errors you see here are one standard. Okay, so how do my ages compare to those previously published studies? Well, in general, they're a little bit older. However, they all overlap statistically in age. Um, so you can see here just quickly, 18.3, 18.1, 18.3 for mean ages, as well as a recalculated age of a single boulder is 18.1. Um, because they do all overlap statistically in age, I've included them in um, a cumulative probability distribution plot seen at the bottom right, uh, called a camel plot by some people. Um, to produce a mean age of the last robust advance of the form Kirkpatrick Glacier of 18.6 plus or minus 0.5. So again, um, we're looking at identifying that innermost robust moraine, and here are my regions. Um, and in total, this is 44 samples, so I've contributed to nearly 50% of this data set. Uh, so in conclusion, we've identified that innermost rain, which affords insight to the onto the termination. So the last advance occurred 18.6 plus or minus 0.5. And you'll have to take my word for it, but this is broadly consistent with neighboring valleys such as Ohau and Rakaia, located um, just north and south alongside the um, Kukaki system within the Southern Alps. And also, um, we can use the past extent of the of these glaciers to input into glaciological models to get um, past temperature regimes for the region. So, uh, for example, one from the Rakai range puts, um, or out the glacial model, glaciological model has an output of a six degree temperature depression for the last glacial period. So I imagine if we were to do that for the Kukaki system with all of this data, we would find something similar. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources and all all those involved on the project. And we're happy to take any questions. Yeah. What kind of animals did you see while you were doing your field work? <laughs> <laughs> um, we didn't see any mollusks. Um, there's some salamanders maybe that when we would um, inspect boulders for whether or not we wanted to sample them sometimes they had pieces flaking off them which we would not but when we did that we would see some salamanders underneath um, as well as these spider-like creatures which were kind of cool um, but other than that just like sheep sheep <laughs> i was wondering this if it involved this in weathering processes um on the surface of the rock effect that is the dating Absolutely. So uh, some of the surfaces weren't flat, they might have a depression in which water would collect, which affects the production rate. Um, but in general, um, as long as we make sure to avoid those surfaces, erosion doesn't seem to have a huge issue in this region. We still find boulders with uh, glacier, um, so glacially polished uh, portions of it. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Next up, we have Pete Strand, who will be speaking to us today about a bi-hemispheric perspective on the last glacial termination from the Southern Alps of New Zealand and the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia. Thanks, Annie. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my research which is addressing the fundamental question of how and why did the last ice age end? And more generally, what drives global ice ages? So this is still an outstanding question in paleoclimate <clears throat> research, 
but it has huge implications for our understanding of global climate dynamics, both in the past and in the future. So the way I'm going to address that question is by comparing glacial chronologies from opposite hemispheres of the globe. And the reason that we use uh, glacial chronologies is that mountain glaciers are sensitive to changes in atmospheric temperature. So their changes can register what the local climate was. So by comparing these different regions, we can test um, leading hypotheses about global ice ages, such as insulation changes or carbon dioxide changes or ocean and atmospheric reorganizations. So what I'm gonna do now is just briefly touch on some of my work in the Southern Alps of New Zealand, um, just summarize it quickly and then introduce our new field area in the Mongolian Altai. So this is an image uh, similar to one that Aaron has shown but it's on landscapes such as these in the Southern Alps of New Zealand, where glaciers form these moraine belts here, which are preserved on the landscape and provide clues as to what the local uh, last ice age was like in these areas. So this area uh, constituted my field area for my master's thesis research, where I created a chronology and also a glacial geomorphologic map which is just summarized here. And on this flat bench, this is the uh, by Lake Bukaki, which Courtney just introduced very nicely. And we see these six pulses of glaciation upon this flat bench. The oldest one dates to about 44,000 years before present, and that's over here on the right. And there are subsequent glacial pulses at about 41,000, 36,000, 26,000, 20,000 years before present. And then the final ice position was at about 18,000 years before present. And this slope here and vegetation break indicates the onset of the last glacial termination in the Southern Alps of New Zealand. And that's again shown here, this inner position can be traced around the entire perimeter of Lake Pukaki. And this is some of the work that Courtney just introduced to really pin down when this final moraine position was vacated by the Pukaki Glacier. But what we do know, and I know it's a little hard to see, but within a period of about a few hundred years, ice had retreated about 35 kilometers up the valley to expose this molded bedrock hill known as Mary's Hill by about 17,500 years before present. So this is a spectacular event. This is a very rapid um, event in the Southern Alps here. As for the, um, the timing of these other pulses of glaciation, we first sought to test whether there was a correlation between moraine construction and summertime insulation intensity. And that's plotted here in orange. And what you can see is that moraine construction occurs during both high and low summertime insulation intensity. Rather, we observed that these times of moraine construction occur in between Northern Hemisphere cold Heinrich stadials, which are characterized by a shutdown of the North Atlantic overturning circulation and a southward shift in the global wind belts. With the major pulse of deglaciation occurring at the onset of Heinrich Stadia 1 at about 18,000 years ago. So that's very briefly the story from New Zealand and it's um, motivating some future work there. But now I wanna jump to the Northern Hemisphere and the question that we've asked is, what's the global footprint of this signature, of this Heinrich Stadia pulse speed and rapid termination? So we traveled to the northern end of an Australasian transect, the Mongolian Altai Mountains. And while New Zealand sits in the middle of an ocean, the Altai Mountains sit in the middle of the world's largest continent, the Asian continent, where atmospheric temperatures are particularly sensitive to direct overhead radiation forcing. An example of this is that the interior of Asia has warmed by about twice the global average since pre-industrial times. And it's here that by comparing these two chronologies that we can hope to tease apart the relative importance of these different radiation factors. So the two valleys in which I've been working, we traveled to the Hotan Nur Valley in Mongolia. And I know this image is not great, but you can see that these valleys are quite similar. And during the last ice age, it would have featured uh, conjoining tributary glaciers, which would have flowed out from the high peaks leaving behind a spectacular preservation of glacial landforms, both moraine ridges, um, outwash plains, and other features. 
This is an example of one of the moraine ridges in the Hotan Nur Valley. You can see that it features um, these well embedded large granite boulders, which provide excellent targets for beryllium 10 surface exposure age dating because they're very quartz rich. In addition, uh, tracing the moraine belts can also allow us to reconstruct the geometry of the glaciers in the area, which will provide targets for uh, glaciological modeling, which we plan to do in the future. Another example of some of these moraine belts, these are in this valley in Hotan Nur, these are really long, continuous features. And you can see some of them trace along the foreground all the way back here. And this hill is about 15 kilometers away. So these are huge features. And you probably can't see, but there's little white dots over here. And these are Mongolian yurts. They're called gares. And these are people's houses. So this is a really vast landscape. Some preliminary data that we've run um, in the Sawyer building in Brenda Hall's uh, cosmogenic lab indicates that this innermost LGM moraine position was constructed at about 21,000 years before present. So this, this is the final position of the LGM Hotan Nor Glacier. There are no major constructional ridges inboard of this position. So this is very interesting. This is about 3,000 years earlier than the final position achieved in New Zealand. In addition, throughout the valley, there are these glacially polished uh, perched erratic boulders. Here they mantle a uh, glacially molded bedrock surface. And these boulders, both on the, uh, both the erratics and the ones on the moraine ridges, have spectacular preservation of their surfaces. So they have original glacially polished surfaces on them Erosion in this area is very low, and so preservation is just fantastic. And these erratic boulders just blanket the whole landscape, the, the entire valley, all the way from the LGM ice position to the modern day glacier. So by dating some of these boulders, we can trace the recession of the glacier all the way from LGM to late Holocene levels or position. Also featured in this valley, are these ice molded bedrock hills. These are about 100 meters high. This is advantage to the south. So here's Lake Potan in the background. And from atop these bedrock hills, we've collected additional erratic boulder samples for brilliant 10 surface exposure age dating, which will allow us to trace not only the lateral recession of the glacier, but also in a three dimensional sense as its ice surface lowers. So some preliminary data from one of these Bedrock Hills indicates that it was ice free by about 19,400 years ago. And this, I should note, is both inboard and at a lower elevation than that inner moraine ridge, which I showed earlier, which you may not be able to see, but it actually forms the skyline here, that inner LGM ridge. In addition, we also traveled to up to the modern day glaciers in the high peaks of the Altai Mountains. You can see some remnants of modern day glaciers up here. And in the foreground is this young, fresh, late Holocene moraine. And just outboard of which are located some erratic boulders. So again, by, by dating these erratics, which we will do in the upcoming year or so, we can track the glacier all the way up to its late Holocene position, behind which is the modern day glacier. I'm also constructing a glacial geomorphologic map of the area, which is a, a work in progress. But the story that is perhaps beginning to emerge is that the LGM in Mongolia could have ended as early as 21,000 years ago. However, it seems, if that was the case, that retreat was slow at first. In about 1,500 years or so, the glacier had retreated two kilometers inboard, and its ice surface lowered by a few hundred meters to expose this bedrock hill. But in the coming year or so, I'll be um, analyzing all these samples, which trace the recession all the way up the valley, to be able to determine the magnitude, timing, and extent of the termination. And this could, uh, some early indications are in Mongolia, this could uh, represent an important role for insulation, whereas in New Zealand, we found none. And uh, we'll wait, a full chronology before I make 
any more inferences about other radiation factors, such as carbon dioxide. But I'll leave it there and uh, take any questions you might have. <laughs>
what the biological implications are of those changes. So um, what do what are the changes in epilimion thickness mean for phytoplankton specifically? So we know that dissolved organic carbon is a very important regulator of lake ecosystems, but what does that mean for phytoplankton in these lakes? We also know that dissolved organic carbon can uh, provide other, um, it can influence phytoplankton in other ways, such as uh, providing a nutrient subsidy, but what I'm particularly interested in is the changes in light that dissolved organic carbon uh, or that change in epilimion thickness result in. And so I did uh, perform two experiments to uh, focus on this change in light climate that phytoplankton experience. So I selected a subset from that, those six lakes that I was presenting earlier. I selected Seal Cove and Jordan Pond. So Seal Cove is the higher DOC, lower uh, clarity system, and Jordan Pond is Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the clear system with low dissolved organic carbon. And basically, I collected water from each of these lakes and incubated them within the lake and did so uh, in a way that I could simulate the, uh, the average light uh, intensity that phytoplankton would receive in a given epilimion thickness. So um, I simulated what the light they would receive in the average epilimion as well as a thinner and a thicker epilimion in each respective system. And what we are looking at is changes in algal biomass as well as uh, biovolume and the as well as, uh, as community structure. And what we predicted to happen is actually in the thinner epilimion where phytoplankton receive higher amount of light, uh, that there could be a potentially greater production there and greater algal biomass. Uh, we also expected that in Seal Cove because there are current it's, it's a low D or sorry high DOC system. And uh, any basically any change in light could um, could would initiate a bigger response um, for for phytoplankton in this system. So these are the results from Jordan Pond. Um, we have bio algal biomass on the left and algal biomass uh, by volume on the right. And what we see is that in the and on the x is to the difference in treatment. So a thick epilimion would uh, is a low light treatment versus a thin epilimion where it's a high light. And in Jordan Pond, what we see is really no significant differences between treatments um, in these experiments. So phytoplankton in Jordan weren't particularly sensitive to these changes in light that, uh, that we simulated. However, looking in Seal Cove, what we see is in the highlight treatment, there was significantly the lower algal uh, biomass production. And this was accompanied by, though not significantly at all, an increasing trend uh, in biovolume. So this would suggest that there's actually less chlorophyll per cell um, in these high light treatments, whereas in the low light treatment, we have higher algal um, biomass, but lower biovolume. So that would mean that these cells in the low light condition have higher um, chlorophyll concentration. So what we, pretty, what we think is happening here is that essentially these phytoplankton are feeling stressed <coughs> in the light and are initiating this physiological response to that altered light. So um, in conclusion, we did see this pronounced effect of uh, light in Seal Cove, although nothing, not as much in Jordan Pond. And uh, you know, it's very interesting because a lot of the research has been focused on using highly transparent systems uh, to indicate changes in physical characteristics of lakes. However, my experiments revealing that really these lower transparency systems can be particularly useful in, in letting us know what the biological responses of this uh, lake increases in dissolved organic carbon and changing uh, epilimion thickness can be. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody involved in this project and thank you for listening. Did you mention how you actually did the manipulations? I did not go into it too much, but basically I just um, incubated the uh, water from each respective lake at different depths within the water column, uh, where the average light that we, uh, that, uh, that phytoplankton would receive in a uh, epilimion thickness would be. So they were static within the water column um, and incubated on, on racks in the lake. So did you put shades over them or something? No, it's just some, uh, we're basically using the natural light attenuation in the lake to uh, achieve that sort of different light intensity that we were going for. One of your first slides, uh, I've forgotten what your, your 
plotting that with time on one axis and you you continually spoke about a decline and yet every one of those things showed an upturn yeah so the first graph um it's looking at seki and it's inverted on the axis so seki like it's declining because it's going from you know 10 to 6. so lake clarity is declining although this line looks like it's going up uh, and in terms of this sort of u shape that we have too we think what could possibly be happening is this is sort of like a recovery from changing acid deposition. So uh, that basically changes. Um, it, it could be clearer here, but then maybe this we're, we're almost returning to a clear, a less clear state afterwards, or in the more present tense. Yeah. I was intrigued by your comment that Jordan Pond is the clearest lake in Maine. I think there are more than 2,500 like some ponds in Maine, do we have transparency or clarity data? <laughs> <laughs> I have not personally collected all of the data from all of the lakes, um, but this, yeah, uh, I'm sure there are very clear lakes in Maine, but this is the clearest one, is, as the record suggests. Oh, what about Wasaka in Baxter? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank you. <laughs>
of biology when you have DNA, uh, which then gets uh, transcribed into RNA, which gets translated into proteins, and that's what influences the phenotype or the observable characteristics of whatever organism you're looking at. And the gene expression analysis really hones in on the RNA part of this pathway. So if we imagine that this black bar is all the RNA that's being produced in a particular individual, what we measured by uh, sequencing that RNA is a whole lot of these 75 base pair reads. So we have all the different four different bases of RNA, the four different nucleic acids. And uh, this is long black line, it's just a strand of many of those. And again, we collected uh, millions of these 75 base pair strands. So if each one of these black lines is one of those reads, <clears throat> what we do is align those reads to a reference so I know what the RNA looks like. So we take these little chunks, align them to where they match, and stack them up to get an idea of which genes are being expressed more than others. So this gene, for instance, we grab three copies of, so we can say that's expressed at threefold greater than a gene that we only got one copy of. So in this way, we can tell which genes are the most active in the different treatment groups. We made comparisons uh, between three different sets of samples. We have uh, seven lobsters that were collected from the color area in down east Maine. So this was what we assumed to be a relatively less stressful environment. The disease doesn't appear there yet, and it's a bit more pristine than further to the south. Our more stressful environment was collected, uh, where lobsters collected from the Portland area. Here, uh, the disease occurs pretty regularly and we took seven infected and seven uninfected individuals from that same area. This is an indication of the number of, of those reads we collected for each treatment group, uh, between seven and 12 million. Uh, I'm only, we're only partway done collecting data, and uh, this will we'll end up around 20 million reads, which simulation studies have shown is enough to uh, really conduct one of these gene expression experiments but I have a few preliminary analyses. I'm gonna show three figures that look like this. On the y-axis, we have a false discovery rate, which shows statistical significance. And on the x-axis is fold count, so genes being upregulated and downregulated. So in this comparison between uh, down east individuals in Cutler and non-infected individuals from Portland, we have, uh, none of these show up as red. Red is, going to show significant. So we don't have any significantly differentially expressed genes. Uh, looking at infected and unaffected individuals in Portland, we have a handful. And between the less stressful environment and the infected individuals in Portland, we have many genes that are differentially expressed. So uh, in the next couple minutes, I'll dive into these right two figures, talk a little bit more about those genes. So one and caveat to doing this sort of work on a non-model species is we don't have a well-annotated genome to go off of. So only some of these differentially expressed genes we can actually tell the function of. And we had 10 differentially expressed transcripts or genes in this comparison. Six of those have been annotated. Many of those are complex biological pathways uh, that I haven't learned enough about yet to really talk about here. I just got these analyses done about a week ago. Uh, but the one stood out is a gene that was responsible for membrane division, which is uh, just breaking down of cellular membranes. In this comparison between less stressful non-infected individuals and the infected individuals from stressful environment, we had 58 differentially expressed genes, 36 of those have been annotated, and two of them indicate stress caused by temperature. We have many heat shock proteins that were upregulated, also genes that involve body temperature homeostasis. And really surprising is we had uh, actually captured quite a bit of RNA from hepatitis E virus that was in these sick lobsters. So running out of time, quickly to summarize, there is differential gene expression that depends on ESG infection. Uh, based, yeah, based on ESG infection and the environment that they're found in, the lobsters are found in. 
and the infection does seem to coincide with thermal stress. Those heat shock proteins can be indicators of other types of stress as well. Uh, so we do have some physiological stress that coincides with disease infection. And also the surprising relationship that could exist between episodic shell disease and hepatitis E and B as well, which might be a result from that immune system breakdown. And the hepatitis might already exist in many individuals, but it's just allowed to advance in these that have a compromised immune system. And yeah, have you taken any questions? said it and I just missed it, but um, what is the pathogen? This is so interesting. Um, what's the pathogen that causes the shell disease? So it's this bacterial community. It's a whole lot of different bacteria that already exist on the shells of healthy lobsters. Yeah. It's just at some point they overwhelm the shell and start to eat away at it. What, so like what are, how many bacterial species? Uh, boy, I don't recall offhand. I think Sam, there are three main ones. That have been three main ones. Consistent among all, all lobsters. I don't recall what they are, so I know there's three that we can look into. I know it's yeah. the temperature, so. Uh, you got one more question back? Um, if it's an individual that's stressed, can it not be transferred then to another individual? Uh, we don't think so. So there's been some laboratory studies that's put healthy individuals right next to infected ones in the same environment that's not necessarily stressful, and the disease doesn't seem to be transmitted just through the water. And it's because the healthy ones already have the bacteria, it just yeah, isn't really taken over yet. I think it's all the time I have. Thanks. Thank you, Jared. Next up, we have Kise Tanaka talking to us today about modeling spatial and temporal variability in the bioclimate envelope of Palmaris Americanus in the coastal waters of Maine and New Hampshire. Thank you. My name is Kise. I'm a third year PhD student at Yonkian Lab School of Marine Science. I'm here to talk about um, an ecological model that I've been working on for the last few years. And just want to give you a quick overview of the studies for Homaris Americanus, if you don't know that's the American lobster. And I'm almost sure you know David Payne and Taste the Lobster. Um, so just a quick overview of fishery, lobster fishery. That's currently the most, the second uh, largest fishery in the United States, as you see landing almost tripled in the last 50 years. And the last year's landing uh, actually broke over $500 million, first time in history. So it's booming. There are several hypotheses behind this uh, increase in lobster abundance, uh, decrease in the predation pressures. But um, one of the most um, prevailing hypotheses is that the uh, Gulf of Maine is a uh, uh, going under abrupt climate change and the change in the temperature regimes is affecting their um boosting their abundance so that's so my study actually touches on those hypotheses to give you a quick overview of distribution lobster is mostly found in between newfoundland and north carolina mostly coastal water from the new uh, this coastal um northwest um continental shelf. Their distribution is strongly regulated by several uh, environmental variables such as temperature, salinities, and depths, and many other um, um, factors. But one of the most, because they're exothermic species, the temperature is one of the most, uh, if not the most, um, important parameters regulating their distribution in throughout their life cycle. So many of you know, just a quick example, in 2012, there was a massive heat wave that took place in Gulf of Maine. At the same year, we were catching almost triple of landings. It was in the same year of So this is just a quick example of how abrupt climate change can impact abundance as well as the distribution of lobsters in these areas. But the big question is that we, kind of getting the, in the face that understanding the relationship between climate change and lobsters abundance, but there are, are still many, many, many work to be done in order to understand how uh, climate change actually impacting uh, the life cycle, uh, habitat conditions, and all those things in the lobster um, um, 
ecology and biology. So objectives of this study is that I constructed an uh, ecological model for the bioclimate envelope model to about evaluate the potential impact of climate variability on, on uh, lobsters in the Gulf of Maine. So what is a bioclimate envelope model? It's a very simple uh, type of species distribution model. A bioclimate is defined by uh, a set of physical uh, biological conditions. Usually that's climatic variables such as temperature and semi -peace. And the most common flowchart is that you take a, a survey and species abundance, species occurrence data associated with the temperature of some these such as climatic variable layers to predict the distribution of the given species we are studying. It. That's a quick overview of what the bioclimate environment model is. Mike Torrey has touched on HSI, um, which, which is also a uh, type of ecological scale to quantify the habitat suitability of species you're studying between zero to one. Zero as a very poor habitat and one as a very good habitat. So Tanaka and Chen 2015 developed a very simple um, empirical HSI index for lobsters in um, Long Island Sound. Using the HSI, we integrated several regional, regional uh, climate models as well as physical layers that covers the entire Gulf of Maine areas. The result is the uh, season and size specific, stage specific bioclimatic envelope model that can hindcast the impact of climate driven change in lobster habitat suitability for the last 36 years, technically 1978 to 2013. That's a lot of range. So the result is that looking at it, so this is just a quick example of how what the bioclimatic envelope differs between season for lobsters. So this is a spatial distribution of medium HSI over 1978-2013. This coastal waters of Maine, New Hampshire, as you see, uh, habitat suitability has been much lower in the spring seasons than fall season for lobsters. But the big change, big question is: uh, Has this been? Are we actually seeing any changes in habitat suitability? That driven by climate change. So that is the change in HSI over the 36 year span. So <clears throat> color red indicates a slope. Darker red indicates the increasing habitat suitability, as well as the blue indicates the decreasing habitat suitability in the areas over 36 years. As you see, in spring seasons, a general over uh, increasing trend in HSI coastal waters across the coastal region of Maine, New Hampshire. And fall season, that trend is much weaker. What's more uh, important is that there seems to be some decreasing HSI spot upper and upstock bay, likely a result of decreasing salinity due to the more input of the river inflows over years. So this is uh, just a compare, quick comparison of seasonal differences in HSI change over 36 years. If you go into more detailed map, season and size and sex specific changes, I'm not going to go into each of these um, patterns <laughs> because there's uh, many maps in this to talk about. But the quick takeaway message is that we do see a lot of seasonal differences between sex, season, and sex stage, juvenile, adult, full officers. So we What's interesting also that in the spring season, there is overall increasing trend in HSI. That may be a part of the reason that increasing most abundance in this region in the last 30, 36 years. So this study has been published recently in Fisher Research, and a few local uh, media has uh, reported this result. I've been working with a Canadian scientist that they're interested in applying this model for their uh, seafin and uh, sponge um, studies. Further research is that I'm currently looking at how those interactive effects of variables actually changes the um, uh, impact on lobster, lobster uh, abundance or densities. So the model that what I just presented is just actually adding a um, 
arithmetic mean of all the covariates in collision models. But obviously, you would, would assume those variables should be interacting with each other at some scale. So that's something I'm looking to add it in my model next stage. Mike Tori, uh, my lab mate, actually also working on a fine tuning this model to make it more generalized to be applied to other basic species, such as perchains, scallops, and also the model has been recently updated to cover the entire um, uh, water columns. So you can actually apply to from uh, sea surface temperature, sea surface to uh, pelagic species and basic species. So um, I'd like to thank all my lab mates. And this study was funded by APC to Iger. And particularly, I'd like to acknowledge my um, um, appreciation. Um, I'd like to appreciate and um, thank this DMR, main DMR, for pro providing all the data. And any questions? Do you know, I know this is outside your area, of your field area, but is there a, have they seen a decrease at the southern end of the range of lobsters? Like, is there any indication that there's a, a temperature limit so that increasing temperatures at some point starts to have a, a, a bad effect on lobsters? So 20 degrees Celsius is generally known as their upper temperature threshold. And southern New England has been reportedly reaching those 20 degrees Celsius during the summer seasons. At the same time, the lobster fisheries in southern England mostly is wiped out. And it did, but there, it's not the only reason that the lobster's uh, center of gravity is shifting north from southern, southern to most northern areas. But the question is that the preferred thermal window for lobsters is between, uh, say, 12 degrees to 18 degrees Celsius. In the areas of uh, coastal uh, Maine, New Hampshire, it's getting warmer, so that the, the wind is kind of shifting into their preferred um, comfortable spots, which kind of explains why the HSI in the spring season is increasing. Well, I don't know if that answers my question. Good question. Mm -hmm. So the more suitable temperature range is moving inshore from the deepest waters? Uh, no, this is just um, what it actually shows. It's just a given location and given points that habitat suitability is changing. It's not indicating whether lobster is moving inshore or offshore. It's simply looking at at this given location. Is it getting more common <coughs> lobsters or not? So that's just the model capturing. They're coming in earlier. That's what it's showing, right? If they're moving in short earlier in the season. That's what they're seeing. Well, looking at the, the model, what, what this says is quantified association of temperature and salinity and depths between lobster's abundance. So it's not exactly looking at lobster abundance change at this location. Yeah. It's, it's looking at how that the wind <coughs> of the lobster is, is actually moving toward yeah. their yeah. preferred yeah. range. That's Kisei, um, this is built off of the trawl survey data, right? Yes. Uh, is there a possibility to kind of ground truth this on with landings data on a kind of zone by zone basis, looking at areas that have shown an increase in habitat suitability? Uh, um, I did actually look by zones, and I decided not to. <laughs> uh, there was some sensitive issues that I, I had to be very careful about interpreting this zone zone based analysis, but. Uh, Generally, the, across the zones, the spring season has all the statistically significant increasing trend. More significant on the southern end than the northern end, but that was not included in the uh, studies. Um, yeah, so 2010 was the uh, record catch, is that right? Uh, 2012. Oh, 2012, yeah, okay. And that was a very warm uh, winter. Yes. It was an early winter, I mean an early spring, sorry. Um, but those lobsters would not have been juveniles, right? They would have been adults. Those were uh, like uh, newly like recruited lobsters that so that like the the, mo the lobster that molded into the legal size. Right. Yeah. So they, they that wasn't their hatch year. I don't know what to call it. That was they would have been 
how old would they have been? I mean, the minimum age of that. It's generally between five to seven years old. Yes. Okay. us about an interactive educational experience designed to facilitate understanding of three-dimensional spatial relationships within archaeological excavations. It didn't look that wordy when I first wrote it down, but when I made the PowerPoint, I was like, wow, that is a lot of words. So a shorter version of that is I'd like to tell you about an um, educational app that I designed and developed earlier this year for the iPad that is, as it says, supposed to study about space in archaeology. So popular depictions of archaeology are fraught with problems. They are so problematic in so many ways. And one of those ways in which they are problematic is that they are very focused on stuff. They are stuff oriented. You see an emphasis on things, maybe some adventures and danger on the way to and from the things, but it's mostly about the thing and not what we can learn from the context of the thing. In reality, much of what we do in the field looks like this careful note taking, rolling out measuring tape, taking measurements in three dimensions. I understand this doesn't make for compelling cinema. No one wants to watch people roll out measuring tape for two hours when they can be like battling zombies or whatever. But this is what it's really like. And I feel like it's something that's really important for people to understand to combat things like looting out of pure ignorance and things like that to educate people as to why eroding coastal sites are important to protect because their context is so valuable. So I've been trying to come up with an easy way to communicate this to a general audience in a short amount of time that they can interact with. Because if you're going to teach people about space, the best thing to do is actually let them interact with the space. I made this uh, a monument to recreational carpentry and duct tape a couple of years ago <laughs> for Climate Change Science Day. And it was supposed to represent a single excavation area had platforms inside on which you could place those trays. The trays had different artifacts or evidence of cultural activities on them, like mock hearths and things like that, that we could move around within that space and talk about how the interpretation of that distribution of materials might change based on where those things were. The trouble was I was doing this in maybe 20 minute time periods with groups of high schoolers, and it took way too long to explain and it was still confusing once they interacted with it. So I needed to find something better. Now I grew up in what I consider to be the golden age of educational gaming. <laughs> <laughs> Games were fun, they were compelling. You wanted to come to school and play them, it was the best part of the day. They had graphics, but they weren't too complex. It didn't detract from the learning and the meaning and things like that. I was, I was really inspired by this. So when I started working at the Virtual Environment and Multimodal Interaction Lab over there in Carnegie back in June, I decided that I wanted to develop some sort of software that would allow people to actually participate in an archaeological excavation without having to actually go out to the field and maybe break stuff and injure themselves or whatever. So <laughs> I was working with the Oculus Rift Development Kit 2 and the Leap Motion Infrared Hand Tracker to try and develop something where people could actually dig with a trowel and interact and all of that. Um, they work in conjunction with each other. There are plugins that facilitate that partnership. I modeled some 3D artifacts based on laser scans that I took in the archaeology lab, but those were fabricated in Blender uh, based on those models. And I created an environment in which this would take place using the Unity game development engine. So it looked really nice. But I ran into a lot of issues. There's a shot of it actually in dev mode on the computer. This is the uh, development staging, and this is actually the game mode. So the Oculus Rift, while it's the most well-known head-mounted display, it is very much a consumer-grade head-mounted display. That is to say, it has a lot of frame rate issues. It has resolution issues that you might not find in a higher end virtual reality apparatus. The Oculus Rift, no matter how I 
fiddled with the settings, was not rendering my environment in a way that I was satisfied with. The Leap Motion, they've since released a new uh, software development kit, and I would really like to revisit using it, but I was having a lot of range issues where the hand was moving to a certain part of the screen and the Leap Motion was no longer able to track it, which is really problematic if you're trying to simulate a real world activity. If you're digging at a site, your hand isn't going to abruptly disappear. <laughs> Usually. I, I don't want to rule it out, it could happen. But, and there were uh, some issues like when you would pick up the trowel and it would fling back at your face. <laughs> Super dangerous. You don't want to encourage people to, to do that. So, so over Christmas break, I decided that I was going to port it to the iPad. So I reconfigured the entire project, I wrote a bunch of new scripts, and I made a touch version of the program. So this is the start screen. And when the trowel is tapped, it's not showing up super great on this projector, but when the trowel is tapped, five layers of dirt appear and eight artifacts are spawned in completely randomized locations every time with also random location, uh, random rotation, excuse me. So this ensures that the game is completely different every time you play it. The artifacts are never going to be in the same place. They're never going to look the same. You can't see this well at all, unfortunately. But um, I ran into some issues with rendering the dirt layers as I was going through this. And uh, there were shadows in the, in the build version on the PC, but for some reason, they wouldn't come out when I ported it to the iPad. And I think it may have to do with the resolution limitations of that device, possibly. But um, I tried doing different types of dirt, and it just it didn't look good. It was detracting too much from the other visuals, and I didn't really want to focus on that. So I tinted the dirt with a slight rainbow tint. So the top layer is red and the bottom layer is blue, kind of my own little tribute to classic games like Atari's Breakout. Um, <laughs> but I felt like it would be kind of an intuitive progression where somebody would kind of subconsciously realize that, well, as, as this is progressing toward cooler colors, I'm getting to a deeper level. And so far, the feedback that I've gotten on that has been really good. So again, I'm sorry that you can't see this too well. It looks good on the computer. Um, there's a projectile point right there. So the user can actually put their finger on it, because you're digging with your finger. I should have mentioned that. And there are sounds. It makes lovely little sh -sh 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 sounds as you're going through. Um, and then you drag it over and you put it in the bucket and it increments. And when all eight objects have been found, the game ends and it spits back a series of points that represent the spatial location of every object that was recovered. You can touch the points and it will tell you at the bottom of the screen the same information that you're currently seeing up there in yellow, which is what type of object it was, how far it was from the north and east walls, and how far it was from the surface. Now, you're probably looking at this and thinking, but this is only in two dimensions. I want three, because this is space we're talking about. And that is something that I'm still working on developing. I have some really good ideas for how I'm going to represent that and make it manipulable for the user. Um, I think I can respawn the five layers of dirt as a manipulable prefab with the points contained within. And then you can just kind of flip it around <coughs> and check it out. But it is fully playable to this extent. And this should play a video. Yes, it worked. There was concern that it might not work, but it is working. And this is actually the gameplay in action all the way through a single playthrough. And every time it finishes, you can hit the trowel and it will create an entirely new excavation experience. Um, this was designed to be accessible to people of all ages. Doesn't require a bunch of back information. Um, I let my three-year-old niece play with it. I let my 80-something-year-old grandmother play with it. They both were able to pick up on it very quickly and understand it. And that's what I'm going for. Because the giant spatial box was too complicated. Too much explaining. It would be making a noise if you were actually hearing the sounds. Um, and uh, I, I feel like this is, this is close to what I wanted to achieve with that. So I'm, I'm really interested in continuing to develop this as educational software and maybe work with other people on developing educational software to communicate their own research interests and things about their discipline that maybe public knowledge of is kind of limited. So um, 
and this is, this is interesting too because on this one it spawned all the artifacts right there. I'd like to do some scripting later on to uh, detect when artifacts are in close proximity to one another and inform the user that there is a possibility that these could have represented a related activity area because of their proximity in space and you know tell people which stratum they're in and all of that. So that's that's future work that will happen. Just hasn't happened yet because I haven't had time. But I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has. project it sounds like a good uh, progress report but I would say you're still artifact focused uh, it sounds like you're trying to get towards the stratigraphy and the uh, uh, cultural anthropological aspects but obviously that's going to be tough yeah yeah and and it's something that I've put a lot of consideration into different ways that I might approach it and I'm not super stoked on the name one of my colleagues came up with it I have not been able to come up with something better so it's kind of stayed as it is for now, but it sounds really object focused. So that's the, not what I'm doing. By the way, uh, yes. dirt is what you clean off your trousers. <laughs> Soil. Soil. No. Sediment. Sediment. All right. All right. Soil. Very, very sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if when you find you know a gouge or a biface, do you have it or, or are you working toward having it explain what that is? Yes. Cool. Yeah, that, like is, that, that is on the agenda. Awesome. Um, and like I said, they're actually modeled after real world objects. Yeah, so yeah, which would be really cool to you know understand. I'd like to is. spread it out to different types of objects, maybe faunal remains and stuff like that yeah. as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So is this a, is that level on the ice No, uh, but we're hoping to get it up there at some point. We do have a, a uh, app store development license at the lab. And would be other is, uh, are you planning to port it to like an Android device as well? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I can very easily port it to Android from Unity. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that was actually really great about this is it was super easy to port it because um, I was using a lot of mouse scripting for testing purposes, and Unity intuitively translates mouse scripting as touch when you port to a touch device. So I didn't have to write a bunch of new scripts, which was fantastic. Yeah, I, I've uh, been in discussions with a colleague who does a lot of educational stuff about that. It's definitely something that I'm interested in. Um, I really like the idea of bringing science to kids in an easily digestible way. And uh, I, I would like to see how it actually plays out. Could you kind of extend this so that you've got kind of an extra module where you're actually kind of basing the finds on some kind of um, artifact assemblage that we know about. Absolutely. Where the kids could then try and guess what they in fact kind of dug up. For sure. Yeah, that would actually be really cool. Um, I got copyright on the idea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Special you. thanks to Thank Nebraska. Thank you, Kendra. I think we're going to have to have okay. questions now. Cool. Next up, we have Nikki Spaulding. Uh, take it away, Nikki. Thanks. <laughs> so I originally wrote my first two-minute abstract, and then it kind of felt like choosing your favorite child. And I've been told by people with children, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> so I wrote a couple more two-minute abstracts. So these will all just be quick summaries of some of the projects that I'm working on right now. They're all incredibly variable in terms of their spatial and temporal focus, but if I had to choose um, a single topic that sort of threads through all three of them, I would say that I'm trying to use underutilized resources or archives and emerging applications in order to better understand climate. So if you really need a thread, that's the thread. So we'll start with the oldest project in terms of the temporal focus and the project that I've been working on the longest, and that's um, Finding the oldest ice in the Allen Hill Blue Ice area in Antarctica. This is um, work that I started when I was doing my PhD, working with Paul and Andre. Um, most recently, we've added a couple more collaborators, including Seth Campbell and Helen Conway at the University of Washington. So, <clears throat> just to get you a little bit oriented, um, 
this particular map has the same um, focus or the same orientation as the map that Lynn presented yesterday. So we have the Ross Ice Shelf around here. We've got the South Pole way up here. And we're focusing on this tiny box here. This is the Allen Hill Blue Ice area. Um, over the past, I don't know, four years, um, we've published three papers uh, related to both the age of the ice in this location and how the ice is moving um, through the area. Um, we are focusing specifically on the main ice field. So this is um, the GPS work that we've done showing um, how quickly the ice is flowing through the area. And we also have a couple ice cores that we collected. So there's one over here um, and there's one here. So um, the onflow ice core, we were able to show that it is um, covers the time period from about 90 to 250,000 years ago. And the offflow ice core um, is the one that has millions of old ice. Um, this is really exciting because one of the major goals of the ice coring community as defined by um, the International Partnership in Ice Coring Science is to um, collect 1.5 million year old ice in order to better understand the way the ice is going to transition. So we have um, very close to that, but it's in this sort of very strange um, glaciological area that we don't know that much about. Whereas along this flow line um, that goes from point A to point B, we have a much better understanding of what's going on. So this past January, um, I got a little bit of funding from NSF to go back to the Allen Hills to look at if it would be possible to trace any sort of reflector from where we found that million year old ice to our flow line where we actually know what's going on. Um, so this, I went with um, Seth Campbell and Howard Conway. We spent two weeks just doing um, some radar. And although we are not able to connect the two areas because Bit 58, where that million year old ice um, is located, is so um, anomalous, we did get some really amazing profiles. So what you see here is um, a seven megahertz radioactive sounding profile um, that goes from, so ice flows from this side here to this side here. And we know that this layer here um, is an ash layer that was dated to about 115,000 years ago um, from the work that we did previously. So 115,000 is not a million. I understand that that much. Um, but what is important to know is that, so we have 115,000 here at around 800 meters. And then we have 400 meters of really nicely layered ice beneath it. And if we have million year old ice at Bit 58, there's a really good chance that we have million year old ice here as well. Um, there's this huge obstruction here. There's another one just off the screen right here. It's a great trap for old ice. So the plan is to um, write another proposal to go back to this location, drill an ice core, hopefully get that million year old ice, maybe 1.5 million. And if we don't, then we still have this 115,000 layer. Um, this one of the second big goals for um, this program is uh, Eemian ice. So really looking at the last interglacial as an analog for what's going on today. So even in the absence of million, million year old ice, there's a lot of potential in this site. And we hope to continue working there. Should also point out that Hal has actually done some work in the Allen Hills as well. He provided me with some um, aerial images from I think the early 90s. So uh, moving on, the next thing we'll talk about is the work that I've been doing um, in the Swiss Calvin Alps and the Colton Assessment Glacier. Um, this is a collaboration between um, the University of Maine, Heidelberg University, and the Initiative for the Science of Human Past at Harvard. So I want to start out just by um, showing you where this core was collected. I did talk about this at the 2014 symposium, um, but at that time uh, we were just we were just beginning. So the really important thing to keep in mind is that this ice core is here. That's important because this is in the center of Europe. And so what we want to be able to do is to analyze this ice core, create a really great chronology, uh, because in the past 40 years that people have been working here, it's not been possible to do so beyond the last hundred, several hundred years. So we want to look at the medieval time period um, in order to better understand what's going on with humans and climate in that time period. And the only way to do that is to use the laser relation system that we have over at the Climate Change Institute. And when I presented in 2014, we talked about how we had just started doing this comparison of our very high resolution laser measurements with some of the uh, lower measurement or lower resolution traditional melt based measurements. Um, and those, an example of that you can see um, here. So, 
So the laser is this really um, high resolution, incredibly variable uh, measurement. The um, black is the CFA, so the two measurements um, match very well. We just have uh, increased resolution in the laser. And using that increased resolution, we were able to count back through 66 meters of the 73 meter core to establish a time scale that goes back to about 1500 BC. So we have additional time points within um, this time scale or this, this time scale to create some confidence. So we have a few volcanic layers. We have some C14 dates that we're using. Um, <clears throat> but this is incredible to go from having just a couple hundred years worth of data to having 1500 BC. And now what we want to do is really begin working with our colleagues at Harvard to um, really look at this interaction between humans and climate. So what I have posted on the bottom is two examples of a time when um, when something that happened in our environment really impacted society. So there was the, the eruption, um, the great the big eruption in 1816, the year without a summer. Everybody knows that's when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Um, she had nothing to do other than you know, sit in this cabin. And there's also it's also been suggested um, that the bicycle was invented as the price of oats increased after this. So these are very sort of um, these are not incredibly important in the grand scheme of things. Um, the historians that we're, they're interesting, but the historians that we're working with are more interested in how um, has the environment impacted um, economics, metal production, um, how is disease and climate um, interacted. So we're now um, collecting elements um, in addition to calcium, including some of those that can indicate smelting, um, metal production, and we have actually found some really interesting associations uh, for the period of the Black Plague, and um, that's something I'm sure we'll hear about in the future, but we're not prepared to talk about it yet. But one of the really great things about this is we see um, this is a unique way that we're providing additional confidence in our time scale. We see something that we expect to see in a historical record um, without having considered it first at the right time period. So that's really exciting. And then the final thing that I want to talk about is um, a little survey um, that was sent out in December, January. I hope that all of you who are faculty and staff got this survey, and I hope that you took it. Um, this is the University of Maine Climate Change Capacity Discovery Survey that um, myself, Paul, and Ivan have been working on. And the idea here is um, climate change has been designated as a signature area of excellence. Um, climate Change Institute is sort of the, the anchor of that, but we know that there are people across campus, not within the Climate Change Institute, who are also doing this type of research. So how can we create some sort of clearinghouse of all of this research, um, outreach, and teaching activities that's more accessible to one another to increase collaboration and also to the public um, to increase our utility um, to the state? So um, the primary question of this survey uh, was, here's our broadly defined um, definition of climate, and are you engaged in outreach, research, teaching, or scholarship related to this? Um, this is essentially really what we need to know, and then there's a bunch of questions that come after it. Um, I just want to quickly go through how the survey went in terms of participation, um, just because it, this is kind of interesting. Uh, the survey was distributed to about 1,500 people. This is faculty, um, the part-time faculty association. And then in order to pull in people who are doing um, really great work but may not be uh, faculty, we also include salaried employees um, to pull in people like uh, folks that are working at the cooperative extension and things like that. So um, this may, so there are also people um, in the salary category that work in say auxiliary services who are probably definitely not doing this. So it may impact it might look like our participation is a little low, so keep that in mind. So in the end, after sending out the survey twice, um, 385 people answered question one. Um, 199 of those said, I don't do this, not interested. Um, and they immediately went to demographics, which was essentially just, um, what's your position and where do you work? 186 people said that they did participate in these activities and you can see the breakdown of outreach, research, and teaching here. Um, in this question, you were allowed to select multiple. So you could say you did all three. 
and that's why 96, 137, and 112 do not add up to 136. Um, <clears throat> after question one, do you participate in these activities? We asked people um, whether or not they were willing to provide keywords that would help us to describe what they were doing. And 169 people um, were willing to provide those keywords. Um, we then asked if you wanted to be included in a directory that we would post on the main climate news that would be accessible to everyone, saying this is what I do, um, these are my projects, this is what I'm interested in. Um, 167 people answered this question, and 153 said that they would be interested. Um, we then went on to answer questions specifically related to your outreach, research, or teaching, just asking you to describe that a little bit more. And this is where these numbers come in. So 72 people provided more information on their outreach, 96 on their research, and 84 on their teaching. Um, and then the, the end step with demographics for those folks as well. So um, at some point in each of these steps, we're losing people to the Bermuda Triangle. I'm not sure um, why, for example, two people would provide keywords, but but not then go on to answer the third question, but but it happened. So this is kind of interesting. How, how do we, in the future, pre prevent this kind of loss throughout the survey? Um, I just want to quickly show you some of that demographic information. Um, because by my count, there are 69 people listed on the Climate Change Institute um, website as faculty um, and staff. And we have 153 people that are saying they're interested in being part of this directory. So although it seems like a small number in terms of um, the overall population that was surveyed, this is pretty exciting because that's 84 additional people um, that are doing something and they want to share it. So this is the breakdown of where those respondents are coming from. For those that said other or research center or institute, um, they had the opportunity to provide more information about this. Um, so I think it's pretty exciting because we're pulling in people from all over campus. Um, because the participation did seem a, a little bit low, the idea is to put together an example of you know, one of these profiles that will be included in the directory and send it out again to see if people will feel more comfortable with something that their um, peers and colleagues have participated in. Um, so I just need to acknowledge funding sources and um, collaborators for all of these projects, um, but I'd be happy to take questions about any of those things. about diagnostics, trends, and climate model projections of U.S. summer heat waves. I'll close this up there. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any slides because this is work that the funding has just arrived at the University of Maine, so I'm going to talk about uh, work that I, I plan to be doing here. So I, I'm, I'm using this sort of as an opportunity to sort of introduce myself to you all uh, as a new uh, associate research professor in the Climate Change Institute. So this uh, particular symposium has been great for me to, to get a sense of the full breadth of the, the research that's, that's been done here and is ongoing. So that's, that's, that's been great from my perspective from a learning point of view. And uh, of course, Aaron's uh, talk last night was excellent. Uh, I find his enthusiasm uh, for his work is both well, sort of infectious and uh, inspiring, actually. So thank you. Um, a little bit about what I'm doing. Uh, the, the the title of my talk about studying heat waves is is one activity. Uh, this is a NOAA funded project um, looking at summertime heat waves in the U.S. So what do we mean by a heat wave? We're talking about a few days of extreme temperatures. What do we mean by extreme? Uh, that's where you run into the problem with heat waves. There's no universal definition, but <clears throat> you could look at absolute thresholds and say temperatures, say, above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, of course, it's a lot easier to reach that threshold if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, than you do in Orono, Maine. So very often we revert to looking at percentiles. We're in the 
95th percentile of daily temperatures, uh, for example, for a few consecutive days. So these tend to be short-lived events. So why do we care uh, about heat waves? Why study them? Well, from a sort of societal, practical, environmental point of view, I mean, they're, they're associated with various impacts, such as market increases in uh, energy demand or, or water use or stresses on crops, or stresses on human health. Uh, as an extreme example of stresses on human health, there was a paper that came out, I believe it was this year, in uh, Nature Climate Change, looking at uh, extreme temperatures in the Middle East. And the thing is about our body, uh, in room temperature like this, it's easy to maintain our body temperature because we're warmer than the surroundings, so we're burning up a lot of energy from the breakfast we had this morning um, to actually stay warm. But when the temperatures begin to get high, uh, our body starts to get stressed in terms of its ability to cool. So there's something known as the wet ball of temperature that I'm sure Professor Amash has explained to you that there's an old device where you just take a thermometer with a, with a piece of cloth that's wet and attached to it, and basically you spin this thing around until the, the air next to this thermometer cools due to the evaporation of water into it. So that's what your body's doing, right? You're trying to lose heat by evaporating water. Well, what happens when this wet bulb temperature begins to approach your body temperature? You die. <laughs> when you reach a certain threshold, your body simply can't cool and it overheats. And in this study, it said based on climate projections, the amount of water vapor in the air combined with the amount of moisture can actually reach that threshold pretty humbling if the business as usual scenario uh, actually uh, is manifest as the model suggests, um, that could happen within 100 years. Um, let's hope we avert that. Um, but my specific work, um, from a scientific point of view, I think heat waves are, are interesting in their own right. They're, they're not as sexy as other thing, extremes in the climate system that get a lot of attention. How are hurricanes going to change with climate change? How are tornadoes going to change? Um, so scientifically, you know, often the, the, the very simplified version of climate change is that, well, listen, despite the enormous complexity of the, of the climate system, climate change is, is basically the idea of this. We have more energy coming into the system than we have going out. There's an imbalance of energy. So the planet has to warm. As the planet warms, the overall temperature distribution shifts towards higher values. So it's more likely that you're going to occur, things are going to occur out on the, the high end of the tail of the distribution, the extreme events, such as heat waves. But of course, that's sort of the global view. And from my perspective, it's is it just me or has the world like increased its temperature by about 0.85 degrees in the last 130 years? It's not something that we care about, right? It's what happens locally or regionally. And so that's where I'm interested in heat waves. How do they vary uh, regionally in terms of their frequency or their persistence characteristics? What happens if we include uh, water vapor and combine that with temperature? And how does that affect our definition of heat waves and how will that change in the future? How well do the models, the climate models that we're using to make these projections actually capture these associates that we see in the real world? And particularly in North America, uh, how is the loss of Arctic sea ice, for example? So during the melt season in the summertime, of course, we have this downward trend in sea ice. Ice has a very strong albedo. If you melt the ice, you're absorbing more energy you're decreasing the temperature contrast between the poles and, and the mid-latitudes, which affects the overall uh, circulation of the atmosphere. Will that lead, as some suggest, to more prolonged heat waves? Others have suggested that that will do just the opposite. So that's the sort of things I want to investigate there. Um, I'm not being told to clam up yet, so uh, I will just add one more thing that I'm doing, and I've done a, I'm afraid a bad job of communicating this, but uh, I've been involved with something called the Climate Diagnostics Workshop for several years. And I attended the meeting last year in Denver, and um, they said, well, you know, 
we tend to move this from east to west across the country. So we've been in Denver, so we're going to head east. I said, well, why not head northeast to Maine? And they said, well, we'd consider that. So uh, after a lot of uh, running around, we're, we've uh, decided to have that meeting hosted here at the University of Maine on campus and at the, uh, the Wells Conference Center. So what is the Climate Diagnostics Workshop? These people tend to focus it's a, it's a national meeting on the order of 100 scientists from around the country, but they tend to focus more on predominantly seasonal to interannual variations. These people are interested in things like El Nino and uh, uh, seasonal climate prediction, but not exclusively. So what I've tried to do is to include in this, uh, the themes, the sessions for this year, to, to include, for example, the Arctic, and how can we learn from paleo climate data? What can that tell us about the future climate, climate sensitivities and things like that? So I'm happy to discuss that with you in terms of if you're thinking about submitting an abstract, both students and faculty, of course, are welcome to do so. In terms of what are these sessions and you know where can you map on to the individual uh, activities there? So overall, thank you very much for uh, my uh, listening to my little talk. I don't have anything very exciting in terms of slides, but in the in the future. <coughs> when, when is the conference? I'm sorry. Um, October 3 to 6. And yeah, at the Wells Conference Center. And uh, it, we will be, uh, through the conference services here, we'll have a website that will have more information and tell you how you can register and so forth. Um, but it might be a good idea, you know, to, to chat with me before submitting an, an abstract just to give you a sense of what this meeting is. I know it's a little, I'm trying to complement you know, the vast uh, array of activities that you're doing. So it's not, doesn't map, it's more on the edge of a lot of what you're doing here in terms of time scale. But it's complementary, I think, in a lot of ways. So, good. Okay, we have a 15 minute break. I believe there's coffee and snacks in the other room. We'll reconvene at 10 15. Yeah.